Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are most welcome to this program. So the initial one was disconnected because um, we felt some unwanted persons also joined and we are trying to mess things up for everybody. So it, um, we are good to go now. Um, I'm going to call on Avise to continue from where he stopped. All right, welcome back, everyone. Okay. So I will make you the host now. And um, where you see such write-ups, all you just need to do is um, you 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 stop your screen sharing, then click to come back, or you just go to where you can delete those things, whichever of those ones can serve. So let me make you the host so that you can continue. Okay, then. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the for the hitch. Sorry for everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for that hitch. Okay, you can you, you can go ahead now, Mr. Emmanuel. All right. Okay, so like I said earlier, we're on uh, responsibilities of a first leader. I hope you can all see my screen. Sorry, just one minute. Let me just put off a sound. Mr. Okay. Emmanuel, just one minute, yeah. All right. You can, you can um, stop the screen sharing. Let me reclaim the... I mean, Simon, just uh, stop the screen sharing. Okay, fine. Um, okay. Okay, over to you, Avese Emmanuel. Okay. So uh, we're talking about uh, responsibilities uh, a first aider must keep once um, he or she is uh, attending to an emergency. We talked about this already, about preserving life, limiting casualties condition from getting worse, and then promoting recovery. Then we went ahead with responsibilities of a first aider. One, we said safety. You make sure the environment is safe with any danger around before you progress. Then we went to assess, you check the condition of the casualty and even the environment you are working in, it's even safe for you to go in to assess or not. And then diagnosis will always tell you. Will always tell you. Medical diagnosis means you go to the lab, do run tests, and or by first aid, the diagnosis is totally different, unlike um, others. In first aid diagnosis, we always tell you when you go on field, maybe someone will hear this hand shouting, my hand, my hand. And then you reach there, you touch up here, the person didn't shout. You touch lower here, the person didn't shout. But you touch here, the person shouts. You repeat the same thing, the person still shouts here. They automatically, you know, there's a problem with this particular hand you are touching, and that person is shouting, and then to treat with care. That's physical uh, diagnosis. So you look out for signs, you ask where the casualty is having pain and anxiety, and then you establish the problem. Then treatment, we always tell you, you provide the appropriate first aid treatment to casualties. So a treatment or as an assistance made for casualty A might be dangerous if you try it on casualty B. Cases like um, CPR, where some people co always confuse CPR for any unconscious. It's not everyone who is unconscious that you compress the chest. 
certain casualties who are unconscious but still breathing, if you compress their chest, rather fight with their circulation and may be dangerous. So in such situations, we always tell you the right thing to do. When we get to CPR uh, very soon, you understand that. But let me just paint this uh, scenario on uh, treatment. Let's say at the end of uh, this session, the host says he wanted taking uh, us out, maybe to eat roasted fish. And then at some point, someone who has not tested fish before started eating it and then end up eating plus the bone and the bone got stuck in that person's food. And then we're all there. How are we going to dislodge that bone in that person's food? Anyone who has an assistant who could give to such a person should please type on the chat box. Someone is choking with a, a bone in his throat. How are you going to dislodge that? Can I hear your views? Okay, someone said, okay, then he said, use salt and water, okay? Any other assistance? Okay, someone said, contact patting the bag. Let's have two more suggestions. Someone is choking with a, a bone in his throat. Someone said, put pork is here, licking of salt. My question says, someone is eating fish and ended up eating the whole flesh, maybe the fish was well spiced, and at the point of eating the bone, it got stuck in the person's throat. How are you going to dislodge? I'm seeing more of salt, licking salt, and then the tapping of the back. Now, that boils down to giving, okay, someone said use bread. Someone said, okay. So you can imagine now that one person who have given more than 10 assistants to one person. Eat, swallow, uh, lick, salt, and, and the rest. Someone is saying, true, Gary, take a buy, a way to. Definitely, I'm, I'm not sure if this person should take everything you are suggesting now the person will survive such uh, choking. Imagine you, and you see people that they give this, but you see their eyes rolling with pain because of the pain associated with that. Last December, someone took a gold bone and they used this ever to give the person. And the process of taking in that gold bone, it got stopped. The bone, they, they, they ever pushed down the bone and pierced on his intestine. And there was nothing they could do that operate and cut part of that intestine out. There's no way your life will remain the same if that is done to you. The right thing, you as a skilled for said I need to do, a bone is being stuck in the throat. And but I will not solve that because imagine a bone pushing down a bone with something, substance going down the system. You imagine the harm it might cause on the trachea wall. So you don't do that. What I advise you to do is one, you encourage that person to cough. And the person should always be in the same position because every assistance you are giving, you are trying to push out that bone out. And there's something we call mild and severe choking. The easiest way for you to know if a casualty is having mild or severe choking is when you ask the question, uh, casualty questions like, are you choking? And the person says, yes, I'm choking. Then definitely that's just mild choking. When it's severe, when you ask the person's questions, are you choking? The person is unable to speak. The person can only nod to your question. So what you need to do is tell the person to be in a bent position. Then you encourage coughing. Then you do what we call, the ones from people have, have, have already suggested here, the back thrust or back blows, as you say. At the back of your chest, there's the spine running there. At the center of the two shoulder blades is where you make that impact. So you make your hand folded in this way. At the back that way, you hit it up this way. And that causes your yeah, back thrust. Thank you, Josephine. So that causes a vibration on the tracker that expands it at this level. So whatsoever is there comes out without having the tracker was. And if that doesn't work, the next thing you need to do is you engage what we call abdominal thrust. Abdominal thrust, you make your hand folded in this way. And then you go behind the person and create that fist below the abdomen. And then you thrust the person towards you. Your, your navel is also connected to your trachea. So once that happens, it induces vomiting. Whatsoever is there comes out without having the trachea was. So you don't give salt, you don't give a bath, a wedu, and the rest. To someone who is choking. Rather, you encourage the person to cough when it's severe choking, and then you make that back uh, five back thrust. If it doesn't work, 
then you engage the abdominal thrust to dislodge whatsoever is there. Have we ever seen a, a child conversing before? Ch child uh, conversing with children. What do you think we should give a child that's um, a child that is conversing? What assistance, first aid assistance, do you feel you are skilled for say that are expected to give when a child is conversing? Because it's a medical condition that mostly we have sent so many children, little children, to their uh, their grave because of that. So if a child is conversing, what what do you need to do? You can just drop in your suggestions, what you need to do on the chat box. Let's just have two or three suggestions. Okay, someone says, turn the child upside down. Someone says, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Okay, because of our time, we always tell you, when a child converts, it's totally different from epilepsy. Epilepsy is due to a neuro disorder. Why conversion happens due to a rise in temperature above 38 degrees Celsius. And once that happens, it sends excessive heat to the baby's brain. And then the brain starts misinterpreting signals. And that's where you see the child starts shaking that way and the rest. And most times, people do all sorts of things. You see some people putting spoons inside the child's mouth. No, you don't do that. I was training. I had someone already suggesting spoons. You don't put spoons inside the child's mouth. We're training. Um, last month, and a man, elderly man started crying. When we asked him why he was crying, he said if he had his first aid knowledge, his first son would have been talking to him. And when I went further asking him why, why he said such a thing, he said, at the early stage of the child's life, the child was conversing and someone used an iron spoon to guide the teeth. And the process of doing that, the, the spoon now went down and caught the larynx. Now, if you open up your tongue, there's something like a wire connecting it down. That's what makes your speech clear for the next person to hear. And once that is cut off, there's no way you can speak clearly for the next person to hear. So you don't do that to a child that is conversing. Rather, you get what we call an ice pack or a coat compress and then apply it gently on the child's forehead to calm, bring down the child's temperature. And conversion itself is not a sickness. It's an aftermath reaction of, of an email. There are some people that will tell you that, uh, especially they'll say, ladies, if the child is conversing and then you go touch the child's uh, uh, body that all your children, when you give birth, they'll be conversing. It's a big, like those are superstitious beliefs. Like I told you, it's an aftermath reaction. It's, it's conversion itself is not, um, epile uh, conversion itself is not, um, it's not an illness, right? It's an aftermath reaction of due to maybe virus or infection. It could be due to malaria, high fever, and the rest. And once this happens, you, you controlling the seizure doesn't mean you have solved uh, the whole issue. You have to take that child to the nearest medical facility for tests to be run on. And I always advise parents, at the child's little age, you should have things like thermometer to continuously checking the child's temperature. So once it goes above that, you have to quickly rush such a child to the nearest medical facility. Then we have next, what we call aftercare in, uh, as a responsibility of a first aider. Here we will tell you, you always keep reassuring the casualty. Reassurance means you provide psychological support to such a person. Sometimes it's not even the injury on the field that causes casualties uh, not to recover or have difficulty recovering. It's sometimes the psychological effect. Imagine someone having an accident and then bleeding from the legs, or maybe had a compound fracture, or maybe had issues with the leg, had issues with the hand or the eye. And then it's asking you a first aid that will I be able to make use of this hand? Will I be able to make use of this leg or, the, or, or this body part? And then you, as the first aid, is telling that person, ah, madam, it looks like this your eye. You will not see again. Or this leg, someone that had this injury is not working again. You could imagine that we increase that person's anxiety level. So I always tell you, keep reassuring that is when emergencies happen. After care here means the point at which that accident happened and the point at which that person is receiving advanced what happens in between is what is called aftercare. Once you give an assistance and then you leave that casualty just to be that way, you might have issues on the way. That's why you hear stories like we lost him or her on the way. So aftercare means even when you have given the right appropriate assistance, always try as much as possible to do a follow-up of what you have done on an emergency scene. Then in reporting, let's tell you, take note of your actions and provide further medical aid. First aid, uh, doctors are not spirits. Doctors work with three things. They report you for aiders bring to them. Their medical experience and then the lab tests they give. So if you bring a casualty to the hospital and then you tell, there's always a question the doctor will ask you, what happened? If you tell the doctor, 
is headache. Why is stomach ache? They may start with treatment for stomach ache. It's when maybe results might show that it's headache. By that time, you have spent a lot of money treating what is not there. But once you get the actual report, it helps them, especially things like poison. Imagine giving the wrong assistant, giving uh, someone is uh, took poison and then you, you gave a wrong report to a doctor. Before they could run tests to tell them that's poison, the poison must have destroyed major organs of the system. So always tell you what you need to do is gather reports like what has happened, how did it happen, the extent of injuries, and then the nearest contact to the person. Sometimes a casualty talking to you in the in few seconds may not speak again. So if you don't extract information like the nearest contact, you may rush someone to the hospital, especially private hospitals, and they request for um, a particular amount deposit for before medical uh, treatment could commence. And you might not as a first aider not have that money readily available there, but the next nearest contact to that person may have the money. But if you don't extract those information when the person was able to speak to you, there might be no help coming in. We call that indirect first aid, whereby you get assistance from another aid uh, source to the person. So always tell you, you do that. There's what we call professional ethics or treatment priorities when approaching an emergency scene as the only first aider on field. So let me ask this question. You are just the only skilled first aider approaching an emergency scene and you saw four casualties lying that way or some even shouting. The first casualty had a major uh, spray on this particular part of the hand and he heard the hand shouting, Please, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? And then the next casualty will add a major, um, it was an explosion. So the top layer of his skin got burned. And then the third casualty was just lying, not even responding to anything. And then the fourth casualty had a major artery damage on his upper arm. And blood was gushing out. He heard it shouting around, you people should help me, I'm dying, I'm dying. Now, if I attend to this emergency, who will you attend to force in order of priority? First, we have someone with a sprain. Second, we have a casualty with bones on the top layer of the skin. Third, we have the casualty just lying, not responding to anything. Then we have the fourth casualty, the one with the major artery damage on the upper arm, running, blood gushing out and head it running. Who will you attend to first in order of priority? Someone said not responding. Someone said bleeding. Third casualty, fourth, first, third. Okay, because of our time, it's the third casualty you attend first in order of priority. And our third casualty here is the unconscious casualty. Thank you very much. That's the first casualty you attend to. Because that person's chances of recovery or death is, it could, anything could trigger that person to go to leave this earth. The second casualty you attend to is the bleeding casualty. For any case of emergency or unconsciousness, the worst kind of unconsciousness is the one caused by bleeding. If it is not controlled, that person could if it goes unconscious and then you are trying to resuscitate, you might need more blood to be introduced to the system. So in this case, we we'll always tell you, attend to the unconsciousness first, then bleeding goes, then bones go. Because for any injury, the one that easily gets affected is uh, bones. Then um, the broken bone or the sprain could now come as your fault. But I'll always tell you, first aid has multi tax in emergencies. Because I went and I saw maybe one casualty unconscious and others bleeding and the rest, then I should not attend to them. No, I will go attend quite all right. I will attend to the unconscious casualty, but I will subdelegate. Subdelegation means people are around. They want to assist, but they don't know what to do. So what you need to do as a skilled force either is to do what? You tell them, anyone who is willing to give a helping hand, you tell the person what to do while you focus on the um, seriously injured. So that's what you do in... Uh, in cases where you are just the only first aider attending to such emergencies. So we tell you assess consciousness, bleeding, bones, broken bones, and then other conditions. We have what to call first aiders pro professional ethics. One is you maintain neutrality and impartiality. Now you are a skilled first aider. Something happened. And then you saw four people lying that way, not responding to anything. And then maybe a family member was also involved that had just maybe sprayed, shouting. And then because you feel felt that person is a family member, you left the four casualties who were unconscious and just rushed the person you know. Then you are not maintaining neutrality or impartiality on field as a skilled force leader. 
They will always tell you, treat the head of casualties as a principal concern. Here it means you do what we call a transfer. So if I'm on field, I'll ask this question. If I was in this emergency, how would I want people to assist me? Once you have that at the back of your mind, you do everything humanly possible to resuscitate such casualties. Then you protect con confidentiality of information provided by casualties. First aiders are not gossipers. So a first aider is always opportune to receive vital information from casualties. It's not in your place that a casualty releases an information to you and then you go and open a family meeting and start broadcasting the person's issues to them. No, you own your own responsibility is to make sure you assist that person and then transport that person to the nearest medical facility. The only people you own that responsibility of releasing such information to are the medical doctors or medical practitioners who have sworn an oath already to make it secret and make sure they treat that person very well. And then you abstain from any discrimination when assisting casualties. Discrimination in this case means that you do everything, you don't show or act in a way that will create more anxiety to a casualty and the rest. We had an issue there. Someone was trained for an EMS response, and we didn't know the person was allergic to uh, blood. And then we, they, and fortunately, that person was assigned to uh, an ambulance team. And an accident happened where many casualties were involved. Multiple casualties were some, their hands were cut off, bleeding everywhere, and the rest. This same um, guy that was trained was made to handle the first aid kit on the ambulance. And on reaching the emergency scene, the guy, the uh, uh, in that emergency first aid team came out to respond to the emergency. And the guy was just coming behind with the uh, first aid kit. On, so all of a sudden, the whole crowd shouted. And when his team members turned back, they discovered the person who was carrying their bag fainted. Just on seeing blood, the guy fainted. So you imagine you are bringing someone to save a life. And someone saw blood and then fainted on field. What you are trying to paint is that person's condition is very critical. And it increases anxiety in such uh, situations. So what we always tell you as skilled force aiders is if you have an allergy or you're someone who doesn't like seeing blood and you're a force aider, then it's better when you hear of an emergency that there's every possibility of seeing blood there, it's better you call for the right authorities to come in. In this case, we always tell you call the, uh, the national emergency number wherever you are, whether you are, um, if you are in the country where uh, you are resident or outside the country, you always try as much as possible to find that. Thank you, we call it phobia and all. So we always tell you, call the emergency number where you can't give help or you don't have the capacity to do that. You always call your emergency number to that. For Nigeria, we always tell you 112 for, for those in Nigeria. Have absolute respect for casualty's life and integrity. You always act in a way that you not cause harm to the casualty. First aid is more of practicals. We always tell you, you can't go on field and start talking to the casualty and then the casualty will get well. No, you have to act or carry out certain actions on the casualty for such the casualty to uh, resuscitate. So that takes us to what we call actions at emergencies. These are actions or set rules that guides all facilitators globally to attend to emergencies. So they don't harm the casualties, they don't harm those coming to view and even those who are coming to assist such casualties. And there's an acronym that guides us all skilled facilitators on field. We call them, we call it the Dr. ABCD principle. The D stands for danger, R stands for response, A stands for airway, B stands for stands for breathing, C stands for chest compression, or what some, uh, uh, we call CPR, that's cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And then the, the D stands for defibrillator, we call it an AED, automated external defibrillator. So let's talk on, on danger. How do you apply these principles on field? This principle guides us in the case that we have three major casualties we see on field. The first casualties are the casualties that are unconscious but have injuries. Casualties like maybe they are bleeding, shouting for help. Casualties that have bones, shouting for help, have minor injuries and the rest, shouting for help. Then the second category of casualties are the ones unconscious but still breathing. Sometimes we term these casualties, casualties in stupor. That's though they're unconscious, they are still breathing. Then the third category of casualties are the casualties who are unconscious and not breathing at all. And we call such casualties, casualties who are in coma. So I can't come on field 
and start saying, this one is unconscious breathing, this one is unconscious not breathing, no. I have to carry out these set actions, which is the Dr. ABCD principle, for me to know if this person is unconscious breathing or not. You don't comment CPR or do CPR on a casualty that is unconscious and still breathing. You don't do that. If you do that, you fight with that person's circulation and it could be dangerous. You only do CPR on casualties who are unconscious and not breathing. And the easiest way for you to know if a casualty is unconscious breathing or is unconscious and not breathing or in stupor or in coma is when you carry out these set rules. So danger here means once an emergency happens, something must have triggered that person to be in that state. And that's the danger. There are two things you skilled for aiders do when in dealing with ongoing danger. One is what? You either pull up that danger from the casualty or you remove the casualty from danger. Let's take, for instance, someone is electrocuted and his hand is still on the, maybe the naked wire. You can't just go and touch that person, pulling the person off. The next thing is you might easily get electrocuted. So what do you do in such situations? The next thing you do is quickly go look for the power switch and switch it off. If I've done that, you have removed danger out of the casualty. In scenarios where maybe uh, a restroom, a, a public restroom, someone goes in and messes up the whole place. Messes up the whole place with soapy water. You agree with me that there's a way you be pressed, you have to just rush. If you are rushing in that way and you slip and fall and shout. A skilled force is not expected to just rush into that restroom with the whole ground wet that way. No, you have to go stop what and check. If the whole place is wet, I have to move that person to a dry land before attending to that person. If you have done that, you have removed casualties out of danger. The next is you elicit for response. In most cases, we always tell you the last organ that goes out of a dying human being is the hearing organ. And that's why it's always important you try as much as possible to elicit for response for this person to give you signs if he's unconscious, breathing or not. And how do you elicit for response? In first aid, sometimes we tell you, use an acronym called COWS. The C stands for, can you hear me? O stands for, open your eyes. W stands for, what's your name? And S stands for, squeeze my hand. How do you do that? You said you tap the ch casualty shoulders gently and then you ask this question. Why running what we call blue check on the casualty? Blue check means you check from the casualty's head to the toe, from the toe back to the head to see if the casualty could give you any sign. The good thing with eliciting for response is catches are always eager to give you response because they know what will happen, especially in this part of the world. When you start tapping casualties, lifting up, they are skilled for aiders. Immediately they lift your hand and you fall. You are 50% dead to them. Immediately they shake your body and you don't respond. Somebody at that point will start shouting, ah, this one is dead. Imagine so, someone shouting that you are dead and the person might not struggle, struggle with life again, may end up giving up. So we always tell you, speak fine words to the person when you're sitting for response. So when you tap, they are always eager to, to do that, to give you a sign because they know if they remain silent, the next thing is they are being bundled into the mortuary. So a casualty is always eager to give you any sign once you tap. Even if the person is deaf and dumb, once you tap on the shoulders, the person receives a sensation that someone is trying to communicate and they want to give a little sign. When you have done that, the next thing is you open casualties airway. In every emergency, there's always presence of shock. And depending on how high that shock rate is, it causes collapse of airway. Even in good news, people receive shock. Last, last um, um, just January, this is someone was transferred from Abuja to Dubai. And then they told him he was supposed to take um, his family members for the trip. And I initiated 25 million deposits to his account for only hearing 25 million deposits, the man collapsed. That was good news, but his body could not absorb the shock coming with it. Talk more of someone who has heard a loud explosion or seen a car trying to, to hit him or her. You I know that that shock rate increases and causes collapse of airway. That's why in most emergencies, you see people lying this way, this way, or this way. If you don't open their airways, everything you might be doing might not give you any positive result. So, what would, do we tell you? How do you open casualties airway? We say, take this hand on their forehead, you touch two fingers, do what we call the head tilt and the chin lift. So you open it up this way to enable this place being cleared. And then you go to the next, which is uh, breathing. In checking for breathing, in normal medical sciences, they always tell you, how do you check for uh, breathing? They'll tell you check for pulse and the rest. But you know, in um, you agree with me that there are some casualties when they go unconscious. It's very hard. It's very hard 
for you to get their pulse rate. So the easiest way for you to get a casualties uh, uh, um, breathing um, condition is using what we call LLF. And how do you do that? We'll tell you, you look, you listen, and you feel. How do you look or listen and feel? We said, take your ears gently to the casualties mouth or nose region, and then look towards the chest region to see if there's any chest rise or if there's any oozing noise from the casualties mouth or nose or if there's any warm breath. And you do this for 10 seconds because this is what takes you to the C, which is CPR. So you must be sure at this level that the casualty is not breathing before you commence that. Now, if you have checked for breathing or the casualty has given you any sign, that means the casualty is unconscious breathing and you have to place in recovery position. So let me just play a video here. So you have an idea of how recovery position is supposed to be. So you place a, a recovery position is a position you place casualties who are in stupor to enable them breathe very well. And that aids them to recover faster. So I always tell you, if they are in stupor, that's unconscious still breathing, what you need to do as a skill force either is to place them in a posi position that will aid them to recover faster. And that's what is termed recovery position. So let's look at this. Can you all see my screen? If you can see my screen, just tap yes. Let me know if you can see my screen. Okay, thank you. So we'll just briefly look at, thank you, okay. So let's look at recovery position, how a casualty is supposed to be in recovery position. So you could place a casualty in any site, depending on when you are responding to the, uh, an emergency. What you do is take up that person's hand to the chin. We we'll always tell you, lift up the legs up to this level to allow you to turn over that casualty easily to this side. And once the casualty is turned over to this side, make sure the legs are well positioned this way and the airway is being opened up that way. This is what we call recovery position in, uh, in first aid. Placing a casualty in such a way that that casualty could work, we get resuscitated. Once a casualty is being placed in this form, it makes the chest totally off from the ground and then normal breathing starts. Uh, restarts. So there's just one exemption to this rule because there's a question some people will ask, uh, if I come, should I place left or right and all? It doesn't matter the side at which you are placing the casualty. Sometimes you will discover when you go to uh, an emergency, and assess, you discover one part of the body part is more damaged. You could just place on the part, but there's just one exemption. In pregnant women, we always tell you, you place them on the left side, because the right side is an artery that runs, and once they are being placed on that side, it makes the baby fall back on that artery and makes it difficult for both the mother and the child to breathe. So the exemption is just only on pregnant women, but for any other casualty you see on the field, you could place such a casualty in any uh, position. Now, when um, a casualty is being placed in recovery position, it doesn't mean you have solved every uh, problem. Different conditions send people to an unconscious state. So many conditions, it could be a heart attack, it could be epilepsy, it could be um, um, stroke. So many conditions could send people to that, that, that state. Shock could also do that. So you putting someone in recovery position doesn't mean you have sought everything. Immediately that person is being placed in that position, find a way to evacuate such a person to the nearest medical facility. Because you have done, what you are doing is an assistant, but where the person needs to resuscitate fast is where he or she could get advanced aid. We always tell for say that 99% of what you are doing is external. It's what you see at the body part to try to assist or reduce uh, the impact. But where the person gets a final assistance or treatment is usually at the hospital. So a first aider is not a doctor. We are training the class and we didn't know someone had the mindset of opening a chemist. And immediately we finished training, the guy went, laminated his certificate and opened a chemist and started dishing out drugs for people. First aiders don't give drugs at this level. You're only trained to assist and aid. And once a first aid assistance is right, it helps the doctors at the um, uh, medical facilities to make their job more easier. It's when there's a 40, 
first aid assistance, then definitely the, the condition of that person worsens and then chances of recovery become slim. Now, when you check for danger, elicit for response, open casualties airway, check for breathing, and the casualty is not breathing. Definitely, you have to give what we call cardio pulmonary resuscitation. That's what so, uh, we term it in um, acronym form CPR. It means 30 chest compressions and two rescue breaths. The one some people call kiss of life. How do you give CPR? Let me share um, this video also. So you have a visual expression on how CPR works in the system. So if you can uh, see my screen when I share, you can also tap. Just send a message that yes, you can see. Can you all see my video? All right, thank you very much. Okay, good. Now, this is how the heart works. This is how the heart works. So once there is a medical condition, sometimes it obstructs the heart function and then the heart stops working uh, or performing its main function of pumping blood around the system. And then that's where CPR now comes in. Once this happens, the person goes unconscious and is unable to breathe. So we tend them casualties some most times in, com in coma. What you need to do, what you need to do at this point is compress the chest heart. We always tell you compress the chest 30 times and then give two rescue breaths to such a person. And where do you compress? You say at the center of the chest is where you do compression. At the center of the casualty's chest. And what does compression is the heel of your palm. The heel of your palm is what does compression on the casualty. So people confuse CPR for this. No, it's the heel of the palm that does CPR. So what you do is with your hands this way, you place it on the casualty's uh, center of the chest and then you compress down. And for you to achieve that, you have to lock your joints when doing that. Lock your joints and push in your body to the casualty. Once you do that, you're supposed to achieve two inches depth of the heart. So if this is the heart, you're supposed to go as deep as this. So it, it takes a lot of energy doing, doing that. And CPR is divided into three. We have adult CPR, we have infant CPR, and we have children CPR. Normally in our first aid, we always tell you a child, an infant's life, uh, age blood testers from uh, zero to one year, above one to 14, we call them children, and from 15 years and above, we call them adults in first aid. For an a adult, you are supposed to use two hands to compress the chest. For a child, you're supposed to use one hand to compress their chest. And then for an infant, you're supposed to use just two fingers to compress their chest. And after compression, we always tell you, you give rescue bread. Now this rescue bread aids what you are compressing. It's just like in a car scenario where maybe a carburetor engine, you are driving the car and you are not watching your fair gate. For those who drive uh, cars with carburetor engine, agree with me, that once the petrol gets finished and you introduce just uh, five liters, that car will not start immediately. But when you try getting little PMS and pouring it, uh, that's petrol, and pouring it on the carburetor and try starting, you see the car start faster. That's the rescue bread you are giving to this car that the petrol you are pouring on that carburetor. And trying to start your car with the key is the compression you are doing. You know, in normal circumstances, you can just turn your key and accelerate and the car starts. But to make it start faster is that little PMS you pour on the, uh, the carburetor. Just like in CPR, the little bread you give to this car that helps them to recover faster. And like I told you, let's just watch this while I'm explaining so you understand how this works. So when compressing casualties chest, we always tell you still monitor their body system. Because as you are compressing, there's every tendency the casualty may get resuscitated. We're not expected to continue at that point. The last compression I did on hitting the 10th, uh, 11th count, the guy jets, and I quickly placed him in recovery position. 
and I quickly place him in recovery position. Now you are in a class, you are learning that CPR is 32. And maybe you just went out tomorrow and someone went unconscious, not breathing. And because you have heard that CPR is uh, 30 chest compression and two rescue, but you just compress five times and just inject. I say, wait, it's remaining 25, it's remaining 25. What you are telling that casualty is I brought you out from the dead, I'm sending you back to where you are coming from. So even on one count, a casualty could get resuscitated. You are expected to stop. So this is what happens internally when you give right We always tell you, let your hands be at the center of the chest while compressing. Doing your compression. So when you compress, this is what happens. The heart, you are just manually telling the heart to pump in blood to the around the system to restart circulation. So by doing this, doing this properly, it pumps blood back to the brain and around the system to do. And to achieve that, we we'll always tell you, go two inches deep on the cardiac to achieve that. If you're not compressing very well, you might not, you're not giving that depth, you might not achieve good CPR. So see what happens when you stop giving CPR. You can see that the blood has stopped moving up the system. So it's always important while giving CPR, always monitor the casualties body system when doing that. And ensure after that 30 counts, compressing deep enough, this is what also happens. The blood may be going, but may not be hitting the brain very well to restart circulation. And when you compress slowly, this is what also happens. So for you to achieve this, we always tell you hit that way, and you compress too fast, this is what also happens. So we always tell you in one second, you're supposed to hit the heart twice. So this is the pace at which you go on the heart. That's the pace at which you go on the heart of the casualty for that casualty to be resuscitated. When I uh, will share the, the material with you later so you understand better how CPR works um, in the system. So next, uh, our last uh, topic will just be, we'll talk just five minutes or 10 minutes on uh, the defibrator. Because it's something many people are quite not conversant with that. And then when they are, uh, the machine is on field, some people don't even know how to use it. Our uh, short, an ambulance arrived at an emergency scene, and I asked the driver if he had an AED, and he said, no, he's, that, those, that machine is in the hospital that they always have. And it was an advanced life support ambulance, which I knew that only for me to go behind the ambulance, and I discovered it was placed right behind the seat. But he didn't know of that equipment, what he was actually carrying. So it's always important, even if you don't have it, but you're on field and you come across this, it's important you know how to use it. We call it the AED, Automated External Defibrillator. If you have this machine on field, the only thing this machine will not do for you is check for danger for you or call for help for you. Once danger is, the whole environment is clear and you have called for an emergency aid, and maybe an aid has arrived, you could actually use this. What this machine does is it analyzes casualties heart rhythm to tell you if casualties are unconscious breathing or not. We have what to call the electronic defibrillator. Those ones are in the hospitals where they plug with electricity and then power them, see them jamming the blades and then regulating the body and hitting the chest. They are casualties chest. They call it last resort. But this is the first AEDAS AED. This works with a battery. You could move it anywhere. Now, what an AED does is it has two parts, as you can see here. One part goes above the casualties heart rhythm while the other chest region, while the other one goes the opposite side below the chest region. The good thing with aid is it's all displayed on the part for you to use. The machine has an on and shock button. Usually the shock button is like a love sign. Some come to shock circuit and the rest. And then the on button. Once you on this machine, it runs a self check on its own to tell you if the machine is okay to be in use or not. Once the machine is okay, if the parts have not expired, the machine will run a check and tell you it's okay to use. If the parts have expired, it might tell you to change parts of the battery are weak. It will tell you the batteries are weak. You should change. But once everything is set, the machine will tell you to cut casualties clothing if needed. 
The reason is because the parts are meant to stick directly on the casualty skin and not on their clothing. So once you detach these parts or make the, you place one here and then place there, and then the machine starts analyzing. The casualty is unconscious breathing. The machine has a voice command. Some comes with voice commands and written, screen written commands, depending on the manufacturer. So what happens is the machine will analyze. If the casualty is unconscious breathing, the machine may advise you to place in the covering position. If the casualty is unconscious not breathing, the machine may advise you to give CPR. And that's where the good thing with the machine, most of them come with the beeping sound for you to know how you're supposed to go. And if you are hitting the chest, not even reaching the, the two inches deep, Adept, the machine will tell you wrong CPR restart sequence. And if you are even doing it well, the machine will still commend you to continue uh, uh, CPR. When you have given the CPR and reached that 30 count, the machine may advise you to introduce rescue breath. Now, there's a, a rate of an unconscious. And we always tell you when doing this, do not detach the part from the casualty's chest when doing this. Because as those parts are there, the machine is still analyzing. So you don't detach those parts. So what do you do? Once this happens, the sequence is run for CPR and the machine maybe sees the person is still unconscious and then maybe shock is advised. The machine may advise for shock. And usually once an AD charges up for shock, the shock button here, as you're seeing it here, starts beeping red. And it will tell you, stay clear of the casualty. Reason being that sometimes if it sends that shock, it might be dangerous for you sometimes you holding that casualty. So the machine will always advise you to detach your hand while pressing the shock button. For some AEDs, if you lift or hold that casualty's hand and mistakenly press the shock button, the machine may send in shock rate to the casualty and then give you real shock. You might end up going back to where that person is and the person may have to use the AED on you again to uh, resuscitate you. So to avoid that, once you are you apply the shock button, about to apply the shock button, detach your hand from the casualty. And then once it sends you that shock, it will reanalyze and tell you what next to do. If the casualty has been resuscitated or more or the shock is not needed anymore, it would advise you to place in current position. If uh, more CPR does, uh, manual CPR is needed on the chest, the machine may still advise you to do that. There's something that this machine does, especially for male casualties. Like I told you, it sticks, the, the parts have adhesive glue that sticks to the casualty's chest. You must ensure the chest is bare for you to do that. Especially for casualties who have uh, hairy chest, like the male casualties. We always advise you, do not place that, those parts on the hair because the machine may not analyze very well. So what do you do? Well, it, all, most AEDs come with shaving sticks. So what you do is you scrape just the part at which the part is going to, to stick there and then you, you place. Please don't go and turn the barber and barb someone's full chest. If the person recovers, you may ask you where his hair has gone and you have to explain. So just barb the part at which the parts are going to stick and when the person recovers, you'll be able to uh, tell you, uh, you'll be able to explain to the person why the hair, uh, the hair was shaved for the parts to stick and analyze properly. Thank you all very much. Um, I think I, I don't know if we'll take some questions or we'll run just a CPT to, to see if the knowledge was well passed to all participants. OK. So just have 10 minutes CBT. Let's see if um, what we said in these few minutes. Okay. So we we'll use 10 minutes for this. So if you are if you are live on this, thank you very much. Um, if you can see this. Just type Slido on your normal uh, browser, maybe your Chrome browser and the rest, and then enter the code 510862. We'll just take 10 minutes to run this um, CBT. It's like a, a quiz or an evaluation to see if the knowledge passed of um, 
we have done well in passing this uh, basic life saving skills to you people. So when you enter it, it will ask you of your name. Enter the name and then join and stay on post. I want to ask the moderator if it's okay. Yes, I love an individual can own an AED. Yes, you can. Once you have been trained on how to use it, you can actually own an AED. So moderator, is it okay? Okay, we have some people joining. Okay, good, Joshua, Shegun, David, it's on the line. Laddie. So uh, we just have one minute uh, or two to join and then we'll, we'll start the quiz. It's just an evaluation to see if what I've learned today. Okay. So I think if we have up to 30 participants who could actually start, others could join as we progress. So what I said is join via slido.com, just enter on your web browsers, slido.com. So the questions will be popping up on your screen, it's just 25 seconds, you need to do that. Quickly tap, on the right answer and then send. So you are doing two things. Once a question uh, displays on your phone, click on the right answer and then click send also for it to, uh, to analyze. Okay, I think we have up to 37. So we can, we can start this evaluation. So for those who can join now, fine. So we don't waste much time on it. So slide it you enter the code 510 as seen on the screen, 862. So please always stay on, always stay on, on pause. Don't stay on Q and A. If not, you might not see the question. So we are starting now. I think we have over 70, so it's okay to start. Slido.com, enter code 510-862. Okay, so let's start. First question says, Aims, aims of first aid include or accept. Aims of first aid include or accept. Click on the right answer and send. You have only 15 seconds to do that for this particular question. Aims of first aid include or accept. It means one is not right. Aims of first aid include or accept. Okay, good. The right answer is make uh, casualties bleed. Okay, so these are top five participants on that. Okay, next question. Next question says, CPR stands for what? CPR. CPR stands for what? CPR stands for what? Next question says, CPR stands for what? Okay, good. Definitely we said cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That is CPR, correct. Okay. See how Maka maintaining the lead. Next question. Next question says, Dr. A, B, C, D stands for what? When we talk of actions at emergencies, Dr. ABCD stands for what? You have uh, 14 seconds. Dr. ABCD stands for what?
Okay. Danger response, airway. I think the table has turned. We have them. Hola. Now, next question. Next question says, what is the ratio of CPR for adults? The ratio of CPR for adults. You have um, 15 seconds. Okay, what's the ratio of CPR? Here it means, how do you comment CPR on an adult? So we'll tell you, you give them 30 chest compressions and then two rescue breaks, or the, what some people call kiss of life. Okay, I think the table has turned again. We have faith leading. Okay, next question says, the following are responsibilities of a first aider except it means all others are responsibilities of a first aider except one. The following are responsibilities of a first aider except. Okay, good. The quick, the right answer there is drug administration. If you watch from when I started, I have not told you to give drugs to any casualty. Immediately, you be the person. So that's the correct answer. I think the table has shifted. This is a five top. The machine we just talked about now is called an AED. What does it stand for? An AED stands for what? It's a machine used in analyzing casualties heart reading to check if they're unconscious breathing or not. So an AED stands for what? Good. All right, good. An AED stands for automated external defibrillator. Faith is still maintaining the lead. Next question says, the acronym LLF, when checking for breathing stands for what? The acronym LLF, when checking for breathing stands for what? So please don't tap, don't write on the screen. You can maybe type in your answers uh, in the comment section. So it says, look, listen, and feel. Look at the casualty's chest rise. Listen for any oozing noise from the casualty's mouth or nose, and then feel for breath from either the casualty's mouth or nose. That's the correct answer. Thank you. Next question says, in order of priority, who are you to attend to first in an emergency? In order of priority, we talked about when you are the only force either attending uh, to an emergency, who are you to attend to first when you have multiple casualties on field? And then you are the only person responding to such emergencies. So in order of priority, who are you to have five, four seconds? Definitely is the unconscious casualty you attend to first, in order of priority. Why bleeding comes next. Next question. Next question says, what is the CPR hand placement for adults, children, and infants? What is the CPR hand placement for adults? An infant. Okay. Adults, two hands, children will use one hand and infants will use two fingers when giving CPR. Thank you. Next question. 
Next question says, what is the national emergency number, please, of Nigeria? If you are not in Nigeria, please, it's Nigerian national emergency number we are asking of. As a better percentage of us on the training are from Nigeria. So what's the national emergency number of Nigeria and not where you are now? What's the national emergency number of Nigeria? Okay, definitely our, our national emergency number in Nigeria is 112. 911 is for USA and then UK is 999. Okay. Next question says, conversion is caused by what? Conversion is caused by what? Like we said earlier, conversion happens mostly in children when their temperature let me not go further. So you have 11 seconds, 10. Conversion happens mostly in children and is caused by what? All right, good. I mentioned temperatures. So that is rising temperature above 38 degrees Celsius. Faith is still maintaining the lead. It's good, okay. Next question says, I talked about eliciting for response from casualties. So an acronym that may guide you in doing that, we call it the CAOS method. So what does CAOS stand for when eliciting for response? What does CAOS stand for when eliciting for response from casualties? CAOS, C-O-W-S, what does it stand when you are trying to elicit a response from casualties to know if they're unconscious breathing or not. Okay, I think we have others. Someone said, open your legs. No, I see squeeze my neck. No, I see squeeze my head. No, the right answer should be, let's see. Can you hear me? Open your eyes. What's your name? Squeeze my hand. You can't tell a casualty that is unconscious, open your legs. It even sounds somehow for those who are around. Okay. Next question says, when do you commence CPR on casualties? Like I said earlier, it's not every casualty you see on fuel that you give CPR to. So when is it right for you to give CPR to a casualty so you don't end up complicating issues? When is it right for you as a skilled force leader to commence CPR on a casualty? Definitely, let's see, it's when casualty is unconscious and not breathing. That's when you commence CPR on them. Thank you very much for that. Okay, next question. Next question says, when do you now place a casualty in recovery position? Okay. When do you place a casualty in recovery position? So definitely it's when the casualty is in stupor. When the casualty is in coma, it means the casualty is unconscious, not breathing. And when it's in stupor, it means the casualty is unconscious, but still breathing. Correct. I think we have, there's the last question. One among the following is a type of head injury. This is more like a bonus question. We have different kinds of head injury. So one of the following is a type of head injury. I always tell you when people have head injury, depending on how the impact is, if, this, if it comes with external bleeding, you have to pad that affected part and then bandage and transport to the nearest medical facility. So one among these is a kind uh, type of head injury. So definitely our answer is um, concussion. 
So let's see who took this. Okay, congratulations to all of you. I can see even the top five, everyone got the answer correct just because uh, of the timing, maybe you didn't make a uh, decision quick. Well, thank you, Faith. Thank you, David. Thank you, Uka Blessing, uh, Ogene, Peace. And everyone who participated, thank you very much. So we are done for today. I don't know the moderator, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Manuel. <clears throat> As usual, you've always um, given a full dose of what you always come to deliver. And there's no doubt that um, everyone that participated in this program achieved their aim, which is to acquire knowledge and be able to carry out this critical assignment. I understand that we might also need to have some form of practical attachment to be able to practicalize what we've learned here. But to a large extent, uh, we've moved some steps ahead of where we were before by having knowledge of how CPR is being conducted. And I think uh, the, this is excellent for everybody here. And I um, want to say thank you, Mr. Emmanuel, for the excellent program. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this program. We'd like to call it a day. For those of you on YouTube, we want to say thank you very much for your time, for being there. Yeah. And um, if you are on YouTube, do well to subscribe. Even if you are here and you're not on YouTube, do well to subscribe, like the training, and um, show some form of appreciation by carrying out those activities. This program is free. We are using our resources to run this program. Those are the least things you can do for us by just uh, like liking this program, show that you appreciate the speaker, you like what he did by liking it, and also subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can be first to know for similar courses coming up from time to time. Like I told you, Laplace Metaverse is out there for you. We are watching your back and to ensure that you get the best, your CV becomes richer, more international, your profile gets bigger and more attractive. That is our aim. Then for you to also have world-class knowledge. Finally, our aim is to make sure that you are consistently in the future. In those days, they'll say some Nigerians or Africans are backward. But what we want to do now is to put you in such a situation where you'll be ahead of every other person in the whole world in terms of knowledge. And that is what our new next course will be doing, our next course on artificial intelligence. It starts on Monday. If you've not joined the class, please do so. It's free. You only pay for your certificate after the training if you feel like it's optional, if you think you need the certificate. However, joining the class and taking the course is totally free. And I strongly advise you don't miss out on it. Thank you very much. God bless everybody. Good night. And I'll see you some other time soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank 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 you so much.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, 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 thank you,